hour, and uh, it's time for Salomon to give us uh, his talk. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Leo, and also thank you very much to the organizers for giving you the opportunity to speak here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about some marginal deformations of ABS river grounds preserving zero four supersymmetry. Uh, here is a not line of the talk. Uh, I will start by briefly explaining uh, the ADS3 solutions that I will use at seed solutions. And then I'll move to the deformations of these ADS3 backgrounds by briefly explaining the method I will be using. Then uh, I'll compute some observables that will help us to characterize these ADS3 solutions. And then I'll move to the issue of supersymmetries preserved. And if time allows, I will drop some comments towards the field theory realization of these ideas, then I will conclude. So um, yeah, the idea is three backgrounds uh, in massive tight to a supergravity that I will be working with are of the following generic form, where uh, in here we have a warping factor which in general depends on the coordinates of the seven dimensional internal space. And of course, uh, the rest of the fields in the solution must respect this ADS3 symmetry. But in here, I will just focus in one particular subsector of these solutions, uh, meaning those, uh, those solutions that respect a uh, small zero four supersymmetry. And for that, we know from the two dimensional superconformal algebra that uh, we have an, uh, an SU2 factor on its bosonic subgroup, which is an R symmetry. And as such, uh, we must realize that symmetry geometrically. So in this sense, this seven dimensional space will decompose in this way. In here, I'm imposing an S2, which is the simplest way in which we will realize that SU2 symmetry. And right now, these warping factors here will depend in general on this uh, five dimensional internal space. Um, a complete classification of these kind of solutions whenever this five dimensional space enjoys an SU2 structure was obtained by, by these authors, highlighting Carlos Nunez and Anayeli Ramirez, which are part of the Latin crew. Um, and basically, what they found uh, was two classes of solutions for which uh, this five dimensional space here is uh, decomposed in terms of a four dimensional submanifold and an interval. And um, for now, I will just focus on class one solutions uh, for which this uh, four dimensional submanifold is T4. And also, I will impose the symmetries of T4 on the solutions. And so the solution is given explicitly in these expressions here where the interesting part of these solutions is that they are uh, uh, parameterized in terms of these three functions, u, h4, and h, a. And of course, we have non-trivial Ramon Ramon fluxes because basically all fluxes are turned on. We are in massive tight to a because we have a non-zero f0 here. And basically in here, I just wrote down the lower dimensional fluxes, but we can obtain the higher dimensional ones by means of cost duality. And it was proven to be a solution of massive tight to a supergravity provided we impose these conditions on the three functions, uh, which basically uh, this is telling us that the, these three functions are order one polynomials. And this is true just uh, away from localized sources. Um, up to here, the solution in supergravity is perfectly well defined. But whenever we have the interplay of these solutions uh, with ads -CFT, we have to impose that the five dimensional space here is compact. Of course, this factor is, but this is an interval that is not an S1, but we have to make it of finite size. And the authors in here in a, in a related work, they use these functions H in order to, to, uh, to make this row interval of finite size. And to be more concrete, uh, the choice of uh, one choice of a possible choice of these functions is given in here, where they are parameterized in terms of these constants here, which are not totally random constants. We will see later on they have a precise physical meaning. Um, from this choice, we see that the, the row interval is, is divided into cells of length two pi. To be more concrete, here is a profile of one of these functions where 
we see that they start at zero smoothly and they are zero again at some other point ensuring that the row interval is of finite size. Um, aside from that, we see that something, this is a piecewise linear continuous function, but we see that something interesting is happening precisely at these points whenever we have a, a change in, in, uh, in the slope. And basically this will signal the presence of sources for corresponding DP brains. And this is happening because we are somehow allowing the Ramon Ramon fluxes to change whenever we move from one interval to the other. Uh, but in doing so, we have to ensure that the NS sector is continuous across all intervals. And that imposes a condition on the constants in here that is given by these two expressions. So um, this is all what I think we want to know uh, to proceed. So now I will, um, uh, I will move to the deformations of, of these solutions. Um, basically, uh, the deformation I will use <clears throat> applies to all solutions which uh, have two U1 isometries, um, which means that we have a two torus on the geometry. And let's say if that two torus is parameterized in terms of these angles phi1 and phi2, the procedure is to deform the solution is as follows. We uh, t-dualize along the phi1 direction, then we shift the second with parameter lambda, and then we t-dualize back in the first. And this method was given by Lunin and Maldacena and comes under the name of TST for obvious reasons. And so from, from this, it is very simple to see that the only thing we have to do is to pick a tutorus and apply this procedure. And just to recall the, the solutions we are dealing with, <clears throat> they are of this form. And seemingly we have uh, two options to deform this solution. The first one comes if we pick the U1 inside the S2 here and another U1 in T4. And the second is just to pick the two U1s in T4. And from now on, I will just focus on the second case for reasons that will become clear later on. So after applying this method, we obtain the solution that uh, basically the information here in the metric of the deformation is encoded in DG parameter that I find in here. And the deformation is such that it has uh, turned on some non-trivial components along the NS uh, fluxes and the Ramon Ramon fluxes. And the, at the level of supergravity, this parameter, the lambda parameter is, is unconstrained. And it is such that whenever we, we set the lambda equals zero, then we recover the seed solutions. And of course, uh, you can prove that this is a solution of massive type to a supergravity, provided you impose these conditions on the solution. Uh, that are exactly the same conditions uh, that we impose on the seed solutions. And once again, this is uh, true away from localized sources. So now that we, that we have the backgrounds, I will study some observables that will help us to characterize these solutions. And the first one will be the quantization of the pay charges. Um, basically, uh, the idea behind this observable is that this will tell us which kind of object we will be having in our configuration, meaning the brains. And so the expression for the pay charges is given here, and we have to ensure that this quantity is an integer. Um, so in here, this small f refers to the magnetic component of the Ramon Ramon fluxes. And in here, I will be computing this uh, pay charge by allowing large gauge transformations on the B field. And recall that uh, the, row the, row, the row direction was made out of uh, many segments of length to pi. So in here, I will just pick one and compute this quantity there. And after doing that, we find the non-trivial, the non-zero quantities here, where basically in order to ensure this quantization condition, we have to impose that these uh, constants here that appear in the definition of the edge functions are integers. Um, from the second line, we see that uh, these new, new objects in quotation marks uh, appear and we have to ensure a quantization condition for them in terms of the parameter lambda. Uh, we can do that only if we impose that lambda is a rational number. Uh, but from the first line, we already know that beta and alpha are, uh, are integers. But now with this condition, we have to impose that those integers are uh, proportional to n, such that we can ensure the quantization of these extra brains. 
And this kind of makes sense because these numbers here will represent like the number of brains in a, in a stack. This last line here is just telling us that we have this configuration of brains between two parallel NS5 brains here. So now that we understand the conditions under which these D brains are allowed to exist, uh, one might well wonder uh, what is the nature of these DP brains, meaning if they are flavor or color brains. And in order to, in order to understand that, we will study the Bianchi identities because basically a non-zero uh, right-hand side in the Bianchi identities will signal the presence of a source for a corresponding DP brain. And for these kind of solutions, this will be possible only whenever we have a non-zero values for the second derivative of the function H. And uh, whenever we take the definition of the H functions, we compute the second derivative, we'll find these expressions here. And um, from these expressions uh, and, <clears throat> and looking at the, at the charges we obtain, it is simple to see that the D8, the D4, and the new D6 prime brains will correspond to flavor brains. And the rest of the brains, they will just be color brains. And at the end of the day, what we learn is that associated to the lambda deformed solution is the following brain setup. Where in here, I'm cutting the number of, of the DP brains in a given interval. And the bullets in here denote the, the word volume directions of the, of the corresponding DP brain. And the claim here is that uh, this brain configuration in the near horizon limit will give us the lambda deformed solutions that we just ob obtained. And in order to leave the idea here very clear, <clears throat> uh, this is the same, the same thing in the spirit as when we put D3 brains in flat space. And in there, we take the near horizon limit of a large number of, of, of D3 brains, and we will obtain ideas phi times S5. So the again here is very similar, just with this brain setup, which is a little bit more complicated. Um, so uh, another observable that is uh, that I will be uh, studying will be the central charge. And the reason why is because uh, in the title of my talk, I said I will be dis discussing marginal deformations, but I should be more clear here because what I'm actually doing is uh, studying uh, a deformation in the supergravity background, which is dual to a marginal deformation on the, of the CFT. And in this case, from the CFT point of view, the a marginal deformation doesn't change the, the central charge. And in here, I will prove that holographic, with the holographic computation. We'll not be needing the, the precise form of the central charge who was obtained in this, in, by these authors here. And I will rely on the result of these other authors that says that for a background written in this form, where in here A and B are just some working factors, uh, y in here denotes the internal coordinates. Uh, for a background written in this way, the central charge is given by this expression. And if for this particular case of the ADS3 solutions we are dealing with after proper identification of the parameters here, one can see that this expression reduces to the well-known result where the central charge is proportional to the, to the volume of the seven dimensional internal space. So in order to prove that the central charge is, uh, is invariant under the transformation, we have basically proved that this, the volume of the seven dimensional internal space hasn't changed, which basically here in these formulas, we see that the, the, the volume of the internal space is given here up to this A factor. So all we have to do is just to write down the fields, the tilde and all the fields after we deform the solution in terms of the undeformed ones. And an easy computation of this, of, this, uh, of this part here shows that the central charge before and after is the same, which is okay with the marginal character of the, of the deformation. Um, so now uh, I'll move to discuss the supersymmetries preserved by the solution. Um, because we are doing these, these manipulations in the geometry, meaning the T duality and the shift, of course, we expect that that is doing something untrivial to the spinner. And the, the a natural question is to understand how many supersymmetries were preserved by the, by the solution. And so uh, in here, I will rely on the Cosman Lee derivative argument that says that uh, the Cosman Lee derivative acting on the spinner 
uh, along the, the, killing, the killing vector generating the U1 isometry must be equal zero for supersymmetries to be preserved. And in a preferred frame for T-duality, <clears throat> this boils down to the independence of, of the spinner on that uh, U1 coordinate. And aside from that, we have to impose also a global periodicity condition on the spinner. And it turns out that in order for us to preserve supersymmetry, the, the spinner of the solution must be independent on the, on the torus direction. So we have to know somehow the form of the spinner, <clears throat> of the internal spinner to be more concrete in order to understand if we are preserving or no supersymmetries. And uh, in that case, we remember we are in massive tight way. For that, we have two Majorana bile spinners here. And given the symmetries of the solution, uh, I can decompose these, those Majorana bile spinners in this way, <clears throat> where basically here these factors are just taking care of chirality. This spinner here is the ADS3 spinner, which will be an important for the discussion that follows. And the important bit in here will be this internal spinner. And we have to obtain the form of this spinner. And the thing we will do is just to solve the supersymmetry constraints in order to find this spinner here. <clears throat> and of course, that uh, we have to, of course, to decompose the gamma matrices accordingly and then solve for the supersymmetry, but I'm omitting all those details here. So after doing that, we find that the, the form of the spinner is given by this expression here where of course the spinner has the, the form we were expecting because these two factors here refer to the, to the S2 of the spinner on the two sphere where phi and six are the indices around this two sphere. And we have some other non-trivial terms which depend on the, on the row direction. And this chi zero in a spinner is such that it satisfies two projection conditions. Uh, in here, the direction, these directions refer to the four torus directions. And each of, of these uh, projection conditions has the number of supersymmetries. And so we end up with a quarter VPS solution, which is exactly the same as saying that we are preserving zero four supersymmetries. And so now that we know the form of the spinner, uh, from here, it is very obvious that because we don't have any dependence on the T4 directions, uh, we will fully preserve supersymmetry for the TST we were discussing. <clears throat> but uh, in the other case, when the U1 is inside the S2, we see that because we have a non-trivial dependence here, uh, we will not be preserving supersymmetry if we follow this argument. Basically, one can prove that you have to put here a projector that will project out this dependence, but that projector will kill all supersymmetries on the spinner. So, um, there is a way still to, to touch this U1, uh, but we have to parameterize the, the four torus in a different way in such, in such a way that we have more angles here to play with. And we can still preserve at least two zero supersymmetry for, <clears throat> for the corresponding solution. Um, so now that we, that we have the, the form of the, we know that we preserve supersymmetry also we can, uh, compute the supersymmetry variations before and after we apply the transformation and we will find that they are not independent. They are related in this way where this is the Villatino transformation. Once again, the tilde is of the transformation after we deform the solution. We have, uh, they are related in this way, provided the spinner before and after we deform the solution is, uh, is given by these expressions. And so why do we know to, to know the form of the, of the spinner after we transform the solution. Well, remember that the classification of these solutions was, uh, was found by imposing the constraint that the five dimensional space uh, enjoys an SU2 structure. And basically in here, we find a non-trivial relation between the spinners before and after with the form. So it is natural to ask the question of what happens with the SU2 structure after we deform the solution. And in doing so, um, I will, uh, it is possible to write down a spinner in 5D in terms of a common basis, a generic, a generic spinner in this way, where the constants, these A and B are complex numbers and C is a, <clears throat> is a real one. This omega here is a complex one form. And basically for, for the case of SU2 structure, we have to set C equals zero. 
And for the solutions we are discussing, it was found that you can choose B equals zero without loss of generality. And so uh, for the class one solutions we are dealing with in here, A equals one. And so that defines the SU2 structure. In this case, we have one spinor or two spinors which are parallel. And so that defines the SU2 structure of the original solution. Uh, but because we found this non-trivial relation, of course, we have to, to, to investigate what is the fate of the, of the G structure after we deform the solution. So in order for us to do that, the only thing we have to do is to understand the action of these gamma matrices on the spinor and decompose this spinor in terms of the five-dimensional one. And uh, in doing so, we will find that the, that the relation of the spinors in five dimensions before and after is given by this expression here. So uh, a direct comparison between this spinor and the generic basis we, we, we wrote down in here, uh, we still have C equals zero and B equals zero, but this A here is a non-trivial phase that did appear after we found the solution. And it's a non-trivial phase because this is point dependent, meaning it it, it, is, uh, it depends on the row, on the row interval, given the, the, the non-trivial dependence here in terms of the H functions. Um, so the, the, the idea in here was that we started with a solution with SU2 structure and we ended up with a solution with dynamical SU2 structure. Basically, it, it is dynamical because it varies from point to point in the internal space. But uh, seeing this, this expression here, of course, a more interesting case will appear whenever we have C non-zero. And that is possible still using TST, but we have to pay a price. And the price we have to pay is that we have to impose that row is an isometry of the solution. And in that case, all warping factors in the solutions are constants. Uh, and we have to use this row as a U1 uh, in the TST procedure. And in doing so, one can, uh, whenever we work the form of the spinner, it will have somehow the same form as this one. But now the gamma matrices will have an index on the row direction. And one can prove with doing some algebra with the gamma matrices that uh, the action of that gamma matrix with one, uh, one index along the row direction will give us this uh, complex one form here that basically is telling us that we will obtain a non-zero value for C. And in this case, uh, we will have two spinors, each of which will define an SU2 structure. And then we will have an SU2 times SU2 structure for, for the corresponding solution, which typically it is referred in terms of the largest common subgroup, which in five dimensions, uh, if I'm not wrong, is an identity structure. So this shows somehow the, the, the why technique generating solutions are so powerful. Because if we are wise enough, we will pick a, one transformation that will generate a solution that is away from presently known classifications. And this is the case for these two. The second one uh, is new in a sense, and I haven't reported that, uh, so I hopefully will do it soon. And the last part is still an ongoing project, so I will just drop some brief comments. But basically all, uh, all what I have said can be summarized in terms of this, uh, what is called hanani witten brain setup. Where remember the information of the table that uh, I wrote down before is just one interval here, but we have many intervals. So we have to, to put them together in such a way that we, uh, we have the, the whole row interval here. But in here, we have to be a little bit careful because remember that uh, we found that D4 and DA brains were uh, flavor brains. So in that sense, we have to ensure that these brains are supersymmetric embeddings or well-defined supersymmetric embeddings. So using kappa symmetry for the seed solution, you can prove that that is the case. So we can take this uh, hanani witten brain setup seriously. And then uh, it was found that uh, you can engineer one uh, <clears throat> quantum field theory from the information of this hanani witten brain setup that basically is given by, by these two node quiver. Uh, in here, the, the circles denote uh, gauge groups and the boxes denote the flavor groups. And these are in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, the gauge nodes are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the color with the color brains. And the boxes here are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the flavor brains in the, in the supergravity solution. 
So the proposal in here was that the infrared limit of this quantum field theory uh, is dual to the ADS3 solutions, the seed ones. Um, and the idea will be to understand if uh, we can follow the same, the same ideas in here to the, the form solution. And basically uh, what we found after we defined the solution is that this set of brains uh, after TST is mapped in the, into this new set of brains. And we have basically two options that we can study. Uh, the first one is when lambda is generic. In that case, we will not ensure the quantization condition of the D6 primes and the D4 prime primes. So we will end up with a D brain configurations as in the seed solutions, but with, uh, with the, in the deformed background. And in that case, uh, using kappa symmetry, you can prove that the D force uh, will not define a supersymmetric embedding. Basically, you have to move them to a point where the two torus shrinks to zero size, and you can prove that it's not possible at this for this solution. And so the defaults are gone, and still you can make sense of one a Hanani Witten brain setup, and then to engineer a dual CFT. Basically, the only thing you have to do is to remove these uh, these boxes here. And of course, you have to, to, to keep in mind that the central charge uh, will not have to change. But if the flavors are subleading in the infrared, then that will be OK with the marginal character of the deformation. The other case is whenever lambda is rational. <clears throat> in here, we will have uh, that these brains, the D6 prime brains and the D4 prime brains will exist in the configuration. And for that, we will find that uh, basically the D6 prime brains are a, a, bond defined, a bond state with the D4 brains and the D4 prime brains that we found after we defined the solution define a bond state with the D2 brains. And the idea here is to understand if, if this, this, this configuration will make, make sense to consider a Hanani with them brains top and then uh, engineer a dual CFT. As far as I know, these bond states are, can be considered in Hanani with them brains tops and still make sense, but there are some obstructions, uh, but still this is an ongoing project, so I cannot comment more on that. And so, um, <clears throat> so I will conclude just by uh, just by saying, in order not to repeat myself, that uh, these uh, technique generating solutions are very powerful techniques. Uh, of course, that in this case we studied two cases in which. We take one solution with SU2 structure, we ended up with a solution with a dynamical SU2 structure. And another solution on which uh, we have to impose the Royce and isometry, and then we'll find a solution with an identity structure. The next thing to understand probably will be to, to find solutions with a reduced number of supersymmetries. And this is possible uh, once again uh, whenever we touch the U1 inside S2. Uh, but we have to, to be careful with the parametrization we take for the T4 in such a way that still we can preserve some supersymmetries on the spinner. And of course, the, 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 the last thing is to, to realize these ideas, uh, uh, meaning to engineer a CFT with the information we have just obtained. And so I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Salomon. All right, so questions for Salomon?